welcome to High Performance, Sir Ian McGeehan. Uh, hi, Jake, Damien, good to be speaking to you. Well, let's get straight on with it then. In your eyes, Sir Ian, what is high performance? I think it's the ability to win under pressure um, and see the winning um, decisions that have to be made um, to actually complete a performance. And... and um, being able to do that consistently and recognise that, I, I think, leads then to players seeing the most in themselves and bringing the most out of themselves, but most importantly, bringing the most out of each other, which when, as a coach, was the greatest satisfaction I ever felt when um, you watch players who are actually doing that and it's the chemistry between them that is actually changing the environment. Listen, what I like about that answer immediately is that you don't equate high performance to you doing all the work. You equate it to you allowing or facilitating others to be the best they can be. Yes, I've always... I think I help. I got help. I was um, obviously trained as a school teacher um, and actually learned a bit there about sharing ideas and uh, you know I don't have all the answers um, never have had uh, but what I when I was coming through I suppose as a player and then as a coach is I got so much help and support from other people who had uh, knowledge that I didn't have that actually helped me shape my thinking and and I always said it to the players that no one person has all the answers, but the answers are often in the room. Uh, and a collective intelligence of a group of people who are pa- prepared to share everything um, and, and their own knowledge, they will have things that nobody else actually necessarily knows in that context. Sure. And once you get that on the table, then you have a, a conversation and and... I think a development in thinking that actually takes you forward. And um, that's the bit I really enjoyed. And then having got that, you, you, you re- really look at the key elements that simplify how you want to work that collectively to get it on the field in a consistent way. See, what intrigues me about that, Ian, is that I love that idea of getting the collective intelligence working in harmony, but what precedes it is the bit that really interests me. For people to feel free to speak up, they need to feel psychologically safe and to have that trust that their ideas are going to be received in the right way. So how do you go about creating those two elements? (laughs) Well, I think you've got to have um, individual conversations with players um, and get to know them a little bit, understand them. Um, you know, one thing with, with my education background is people learn in different ways and people talk about information in different ways. And it was being able to just understand the best ways sometimes of communicating with a player. And part of that might, might be trying to put a picture in his head of what they could be capable of or what they were capable of uh, and ways of getting there. And I think in, you know, in rugby, if you look at what you're doing and what you're capable of doing and you see the impact that that can have on somebody else or another group, uh, then you're actually setting a train of thinking going where what you're looking at is the impact by changing what you're doing or adjusting what you're doing uh, and that impact that is having on the performance of everyone collectively. Uh, And I think if a player um, will give you feedback about how he's feeling or if, if he's got some concerns even or something's not clear, you know, the best some of the best information I can get is when a player says, look, I don't quite understand that. Why?" Uh, and you, you're going through um, that understanding. Uh, and sometimes you vary 
the skills or the, or the involvement, but actually putting it then into context of doing something to make it clear to the player. So yeah, so he has that understanding. But most importantly, if there isn't that understanding, then I get that information from him very early in any... So we're not trying to develop something where we've got all these loose ends of misunderstanding, which tend to, you know, confuse things uh, and try and just get that simplicity of saying, look, this is, this is where we are, uh, this is where you are. If we do this, this suddenly allows the next thing to happen, which impacts on the team performance. Uh, and often it is under pressure. I've, you know, I've called it world-class basics that, each position or each role has certain skills that are very specific to that role. Um, and that's often the selection of why that person is there, why, why that player is there, that he has skills, he has an attitude and his approach that makes a difference to that position. But by doing that and by taking that on, you then have an understanding of what happens within the players next to you and the group that's two passes away from you. And so building that collective understanding of the impact of, of what you can do under pressure. And often it's the basics. It's actually delivering something that you know you can do or needs to be done to actually makes a difference when it matters. It's not show, it's actually impact on performance and that to me is elite performance because it's actually changing what everybody can do and how everybody can operate at their maximum. So could you give a, a specific example then Ian of those conversations that you've had with somebody where you've been able to uh, to come up with a shared objective that they've then gone out and executed under pressure? Um, well, I, I suppose I go back. I could go back to um, uh, my Northampton days with Matt Dawson as a youngster, who was a very natural running, high involvement scrum half, with a very good pass. Now we tend to overrun, so everybody just kept an eye on him because ultimately there'd be a turnover because they were waiting for him, and I, I just said look, let's try and build a game where actually I want you, you to have your hands on the ball four or five occasions without anything happening other than your passing. And I said, wait for the moment where people then forget about you and that's the time to break. And it might only be two halves at twice in a game, in a half. But, but actually when it happens, it's devastating. And, and have the patience to say, pass, pass. Because I said, the next thing is, if you keep passing, I said, there's another breakdown. There's another opportunity for you by passing, not by running all the time. And we, we worked through that. And, and um, you know, he, I mean, he took it on board. And, you know, with England and with the Lions, he just became an outstanding number nine because he varied what he did and when he did it. Love it. I'm still thinking about world class basics right here. I'm I'm reprogramming my whole life to deliver world class basics. I'm good at the basics. It's the world class <laughs> that I need to work on. Look, Ian, when I think about your brilliant career, um, I suppose maybe it's the recency effect really, but I think often about the speeches that were captured on camera when you were leading the Lions. And what I love about those speeches <laughs> was how you got to the the heart of those players, not the head. And you've just given us a very specific rugby example there when you impacted someone's career. But I'm so interested in how you connected with the players on the emotional level. So those speeches that I've seen you deliver, did you write those yourself? Or did you take counsel from other people to, to work out what to say? Were they written in advance? Were they off the cuff? Um, no, I, I mean, it came out of the environment, really, at any point you sort of looking at what you think the players need most or where they are, whether, you know, it's confidence or just a recognising of the environment or the challenge. 
that's there. Um, as a player, you know, I can still remember, and certainly with the Lions, um, when we, if we won the third test in South Africa back in 1974, we'd won a series for the first time ever in South Africa. Um, and that was the hardest test match I ever played in. Because South Africa, they'd had a team talk from Gary Player. They came, they picked nine forwards. They picked a forward at scrum half. So we knew there was going to be a physicality about it. And the first 40 minutes of that game was the hardest half of rugby I ever played. Um, and we struggled to get out of our half, but nobody, and we had to defend. So it wasn't about winning the game, but we could have lost it in that 40 minutes. And there was a defensive performance of just everybody doing what they had to do to keep South Africa out. Um, and sometimes, and it's where the chemistry comes in, um, I uh, had a really good relationship with Dick Millican, who was the other centre. Uh, but other players, Fergus Slattery, you know, I can still remember them, still see what they were doing. And sometimes you couldn't speak. You, you literally got up off the ground and you just had a look and somebody would look back at you and you knew where you had to go next. And there was that intensity of saying somebody was looking after you, but you knew you had to work hard, try and try and make their, their job easier. And yeah. all this, or the majority of this, was without the ball. Um, and that, ha that went on for 38 minutes. On the 39th minute, we broke away out of our 22. And um, we got up, uh, and I kicked to the far corner, and we got a line out uh, five metres from their line. Gordon Brown stole it, and uh, we scored. So having been under that intense pressure, we go in at half-time, 6-3 up. And in the second half, we actually then, a couple of fights later, but... We, we then opened the game up because they couldn't stay at the intensity they'd had. And we end up winning 29 points to six, uh, wow. you know, which, but it was what was around. Of, I knew I was being looked after and I knew I had to look after the next player. So it's a long-winded way of saying, I suppose, that when you've got a feeling... I know what it's like in a test match environment that that it's personal. You know, sometimes it comes down to the point about whether what you want to do and how you want to do it and the impact it'll have on somebody else. And if you keep getting that right, the confidence that other people get from your presence actually just grows and the collective confidence grows. So... You know, when I was talking to the players, different things, you know, I'd, I'd just go out for a walk. I wouldn't write it all down, no. Um, but I'd have very clear in my head, because um, sometimes you can say too much, you know, and I've, I have done that in the past. It's just been able in three or four minutes to actually say what, as a coach, what I was feeling. Um, and And some of those when it's personal, it is actually understanding the player, understanding what's got them to that point, which is a lot of other people going out of their way to make things work. And then what you want them to do is go out of their way to make things work in that 80 minutes. So it sort of came from my own experience of the support I got um, at different stages in my life as a player and a coach, you know, um, a father who put five pounds in my pocket when I was a, still at school as an 18 year old so that I could buy the rounds and and stand at the bar after a game and, and, and still buy a round with everybody else. Um, what I didn't know until after he died was he he had to walk to work the last two days of the week because he had no money. Oh, oh you're gonna have me crying in a you minute. Know. So that motivation right. is I would never do anything second rate and and wow. you know i people came across like that i always you know have that in the back of my mind 
that that there's a lot of people did a lot of things to actually out, allow you know me to to be able to to do and and think what what I've been able to do and and I think um, you know with with players and that understanding that the best teamwork is appreciating that a lot of hard work goes in with a lot of other people. So when you talk then about players having this sense of accountability and responsibility to each other, Ian, there's two questions that really um, spring to mind. First one, in, in this modern age of individuality of people having social media accounts and trying to build their own personal brand, how do you remind them of that responsibility to others? And then secondly, you've got a real talent for almost being able to harness these individuals to get them to work for teams. Like Jeremy Guscott's famous comment that you were the greatest influence on his career. How do you achieve that balancing act? Um, well, I've, I've been fortunate to play with and coach some hugely talented players. And I think um, it's only, it, it's... Like I say, I think it's it's them recognizing that your talent is effect, only effective if it impacts on what everybody can do. Um, it's only partly individual, um, and if you if you get that right, then you find that your talent comes into play more and more often because actually the right things are happening around you because of your approach. Um, and I think the other thing is you respect the people that you play with and you work with. Um, and it's same with, you know, I've had some tremendous support staff um, coaching wise in, in different teams where we'd make a point of going out for a drink together at, at night or when I was at Wasps, we, we used to have afternoon teas on a Thursday and it was all the support staff. And we'd just talk about anything and everything um, to say where we, where we were. And it's recognising that talent appears in different ways in different areas and impacts in different ways. But what you do is you respect the differences that people have. Uh, the last thing I would have wanted was a team of all the same. What I actually wanted was accumulation of talent, attitude and, and, and approach that actually was just pulling the most out of each other all the time. And, you know, the support staff, we try to do that. So if there's something not right, I think what I'd said earlier is you need that out in the open early and you need people to understand that you will genuinely listen and, and that on the back of those conversations, so be it with players or a doctor, a physio, a fitness guy, another coach, whoever it is, you're actually trying to get the best um, environment out and situation, working environment. And in the end, your working environment's a living environment as well that, you know, you have to have a smile on your face, I think, when you're coming into work in the morning and into the club to train, whatever it is. Um, and in Alliance Tour, you know, none of that is different. It's as a group. Um, the thing I had to look at and pinch myself sometimes was looking at the quality of talent, but the quality of person that was actually there uh, in the whole group. Uh, and I think if you respect that, then... The pressure of social media now is massive, but um, you have to understand why why you're there, why you've got a reputation or why you've been able to achieve something. And as long as you respect that um, position you're in, uh, then I think you don't take off in a direction which starts to isolate. Brilliant. Ian, you're a very modest man, which is why you prefer to talk about your players than to talk about yourself. But I do want to know, from your perspective, when you look at the amazing talent in the room, what's your own personal self-talk like? How do you stop yourself being either overawed by the fact you've got the best talent or 
the, the nerves get into you because actually if you've got the best players in the world, well, it's very easy for people to point fingers at the coach and say the players are good enough. <laughs> the coach obviously isn't. So what were your techniques for, for making sure you were confident? No, I, th I think, you know, an alliance level, you're playing the best opponents as well. You know, test matches in South Africa and New Zealand don't, don't get any better. You know, it's the best, highest quality rugby you can play and it's the biggest challenge. Um, but it, I think it comes back to that. I, I still feel, you know, I've been in a privileged position to be able to, to do that and experience that. And um, it's just making sure that I get to know if it's a Lions group, um, you know, to know the players, to just to talk to them, not necessarily about rugby, just to, just to talk. And, you know, in 2009, we had a, um, we cancelled something because we thought it was the wrong thing to do. But at quarter to one in the morning, we'd got everybody in the bar having a drink, just getting to know each other because they'd only been together two days. And in the end, the, sort of fancy thing we were going to try and do, we put to one side and just said, actually, let's just have a drink and uh, learn a bit more about each other. So sometimes, and, uh, you know, I, again, I learned that Sid Miller, who coached me in 1974, he would do that. He, he would just stop something and finish it. Um, and... Again, I think the lessons I learned most was just being able to know that players were being honest and truthful with you about where they felt they were so that I can then respond to them. So they help me. Um, and, and then it's just bringing that together, which, which um, you know, when it happens is just a phenomenal feeling. Uh, uh, and I suppose that's how... I just just look at look at what I try and do is to is to just be part of that, but know that the players will know I've done everything I can to be able to make sure you know it'll work for them. Um, you know, and it comes back to the five pounds in the pocket. I'm not going to make a shortcut to do something. Uh, I'm going to do everything in my power to make sure the player or the group have the best opportunities to succeed. So can we go back and I'm intrigued by that uh, story you, you recounted about your dad, Ian, and it, as Jake said, it's an incredibly moving story. Would you tell us a little bit more about the influence of your parents and how, what they taught you then <laughs> you were still delivering in those lions dressing rooms under pressure? No, I, I think I was always competitive as a kid. I, Hate, hated losers at snakes and ladders. So um, I think what um, what my parents were good at was um, a. I was sports mad. From, my dad was a footballer and an army boxing champion. Actually, um, uh, he was a regular soldier, and uh, um, so it, we used to kick a football around all all the time. Or or bat and ball I mean cricket was my first love as a sport growing up um, and I learned to take defeat as well you know and that's what he said he said sometimes he said you will always be disappointed if you think you're going to win all but he said you prepare to win all the time uh, and you have to, if you're, if it's not right, you have to understand why it wasn't right, because then the chances of losing get smaller and smaller. Uh, and just having not not losing the competitive edge. And I had a brother, you know, he and I, I have a brother that we played against each other all the time. Even in the house, we'd be um, kicking balloons around, having little competitions. <laughs> Um, and my mother, you know, my mother was was the same. They went out of the way to make sure I could get to school for rook sport in a, on a Saturday morning. We didn't have a car, you know. It was it was on the bus or whatever. Um, 
but actually they just made it easy for me. I had no excuses, you know, and that, and I had a lot of love uh, and support. Uh, and my brother would say the same, I'm sure, that, um, you know, we were li living in a council flat. I went to a secondary modern school, um, but what I had was, what we had was two parents who just made things work for us, you know, and we knew that. Um, and on the down times, there was an arm around your shoulder or, you know, there was a way of making a difference. And I suppose that reflects a little bit, I think, in the way maybe still, I, you know, I, I reacted as a, as a coach because I had great role models. Wonderful. I just love the thought of, you know, your dad putting five pounds in your in your pocket in the 1960s and many, many years later, you leading out the Lions with the lessons from your dad all those years before having a having a tangible impact on the pitch for those players. <laughs> yeah. what, what I really, uh, it's true though, isn't it? I mean, that's the reality and it's very easy for people to go, oh, well, you know, years pass by, but, you know, we carry those things with us, don't we? Yeah, I think you do because I think um, it, it gives you structure, and it gives you, um, I think, um, a stability, uh, which which is in you know which is important, um, and and I think then um, if you if you have that, I mean, it, you it means you can keep looking for answers, and that's the bit as a coach, I probably enjoyed the analysis. You know, I was teaching. Um, coming home at night, uh, couldn't get on the telly with a video recorder till about 11 o'clock at night, till I made sure my wife had seen all the programmes she wanted to see. But sitting down and doing analysis and, and just looking at things, you know, and, and things that uh, you could do, you knew would, would make a difference, where it was... Um, you know, I, I felt just so, so important that, that you know, you're, you're back to people who were looking for answers all the time. And as a growing up and um, even in that environment as a coach, that is a fascination that I still have. You know, I still look at the game now or where it is. I'm trying to look at where it's going next, um, which areas or which players are actually going to change the way teams can play. Uh, and at the moment, I am fascinated and enjoying tremendously Pat Lamb coaching Bristol Bears because they have changed the game. And he has got a group of players who have totally bought into it. So they're playing collectively a game which actually is challenging everyone else and is challenging the game at the moment. Uh, mm. And that's what I love. Uh, Pat and I, I know Pat well, and we we speak or exchange texts on a regular basis. But it's it's being in that environment. Um, um, we t we talk about the Northampton environment of, you know, uh, I stopped them kicking for a while altogether because we just had this idea that if we could outpass our opponents, we beat them. Um, so we were talking about 300 plus passes a game, but of course, then just that all it meant was it meant we had to be super fit because if you want to pass to somebody, somebody's got to be there to catch it. And the more we looked at it, the more we're looking at saying, right, all our fitness and all our work and all our practices have to say, where's the next man? Brilliant. And it wasn't about the player with the ball. Correct. It was about the player next to him or the player that had to be next to him. Otherwise, everything didn't work. Brilliant. So can you tell us, Ian, about the art of creativity? Because where did you go to to look for ideas that were outside of the box to challenge convention when you were coaching as well then? Um, I talked to a, a lot of um, other coaches um, just I, I've always been interested in other sports and you know you're reading books um, about other 
coaches. And one of the books uh, early on that a bit, and it was Derek Grant actually who I coached with with Scotland had found a book from John Wooden, the American yeah. college basketball coach. It's a fantastic book. It's about just doing this, getting the things that are going to make the difference. And when you read it, and it, again, it just fires ideas. And, you know, Derek, uh, Jim Telfer and other coaches had a great coach as a player, uh, Headingley, who was a university lecturer, but could get things over really well, Bernard White. So I've got names of all the different things that put ideas in my head or got my thinking going to actually pull things together and then take it on in a different way. Uh, and I, I still believe you can't copy anybody because you don't know what they're thinking and what's gone in behind it because everybody's got their own journey and their own pathway of, in, of, of understanding. Uh, but what you can do is take some of the things that they've got and put it in your own thoughts. And sometimes you'll cast it away um, and, it, you know, something doesn't work, but something does, which changes your own perception about what is possible and where you can go next. And that only comes out of, I think, sharing ideas and being very open with 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 people and, and, um, and just trying to acquire knowledge in, in different ways from different areas, um, you know, um, so that you can then use it. And, you know, I shared all my coaching notes or anything after Alliance Tour, I would share with the other international coaches, um, you know, because it might just flag up something that they think about or they can use. They won't use it the same way as me and they won't do the same practices because the thinking isn't the, the background thinking, the pathway thinking is completely unique. Um, but that's the fascination for me is just being able to have the opportunity to draw on that and then push my own thinking in my own direction and, and then trying to put that into very straightforward, simple things that you can then put over to players. I love that. I mean, I'm a, I'm a father of two very small children, seven and five, and I have a five-year-old who um, is so generous and you wouldn't believe. I have a daughter who's the total polar opposite, and I keep on trying to explain <laughs> to her generosity is at the heart of everything good. And she's not quite understood it yet. That's exactly what you're yeah. describing there. And I, when I sit and listen to you talk, I know we've, you know we've spoken about rugby and we've spoken about winning and cultures and things. Everything that you're describing, though, gets broken down to one thing, which is personal relationships. And I think all too often in this world of mobile phones and allowing others to have conversations on our behalf or talking over WhatsApp and trying to guess what they really mean with what they're saying. Really, you're a firm advocate of making sure that it's a personal relationship. That's where the magic is, I think. Yeah, I think the difference is people. I've always believed that. Um, if you have the right people right with the right approach, you come to the right processes. I don't th I, I, now people wouldn't agree with me and everybody wouldn't, you know, some are process led. Uh, we'll look for the right people to suit the process. I would never do that. You know, I think if you get the chemistry right, then the feeding off each other, actually you get the right way of working and you get to the process which, which makes the difference. Uh, and it also, I think, gives you that flexibility that, I know, uh, you know, I said it, you know, one, th the, one of the early things I've always said to the Lions players is, you must arrive here with an open mind. You know, you've all had a pathway of learning and a, 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 and they've come from, you know, whether it's Limerick or Edinburgh, Cardiff or uh, Northampton, Leicester, wherever. Um, every person's experience to that point is their own. And it is, but they've got all that integrated knowledge an experience that comes out of that, that if they can bring that, put it on the table, 
but add to it an open mind so that the pathway that's coming from somebody else and the knowledge and experience they've got starts to really combine. And you then say, right, if we feel this is the best way, you don't close your mind and say, oh, no, it'll never work. Actually, you agree that that's the best way. And what you then do is put your own talent and expertise in to say, right, I'm going to make the difference to make sure that works. And I've got an open mind. So I will do things and I'm prepared to do things differently because I'll, I'll, I'll collectively will be able to take the next step. And that, if you like, is one of the things that encouraged me and um, I enjoyed so much about the Lions with, with that opportunity for that sort of environment. So if you were to build on that then, Ian, what would you say would be the characteristics of a high-performing person from all the environments you've been into? We speak about open-mindedness. What other characteristics are consistently present? Honest. I think you've got to be honest with your opinions. So, um, and I think appreciate it. I just think that respect of others. I, I think... Um, and respecting the differences, you know, don't make it an argument, make it a discussion. And and what you come out of it then is the outcomes become stronger, I think. Don't be selfish. That unselfishness, uh, but also uh, you have that competitive instinct, which is there, an attitude which will... Uh, make you almost make you to make that last step to make the difference when it matters and and that you wouldn't think twice about doing it uh, you know in the past I've called it the test match animal the ability under pressure to do the right thing um, and sometimes it's not the thing you know we talk about world class basics sometimes it's not the thing that you've been picked to do but actually the demand requires you to do something at that point that actually will and the best and the thing that still sits in my mind more than anything was Jeremy Guscott's drop goal in the second test in uh, South Africa in 1997 the lead up to that was a group of players who did the right thing and you wouldn't say any of them that was their outstanding expertise because the rock that turned the ball over on the halfway line was won by Jerry McGuscott. Now, Jerry McGuscott was probably only ever in five rocks in his career, but he, when it mattered in that rock to change the ball, to turn the ball over, that's what he did. And in fact... Matt Dawson was still thinking, I think, that South Africa were winning the ball because the ball came out and Keith Wood, who's the hooker then, plays scrum half, kicks the ball long into the 22 and chases and then forces a line out, which we win. We then drive as a, as a pack and nobody said as a pack we would ever do that to South Africa. And then the ball comes out again and it needs somebody running hard, at the line, that's Gregor Townsend. Gregor Townsend's not renowned for running hard physical lines, but that's what was needed. And from that breakdown, Matt Dawson passes to Jeremy Guscott and drops the goal. And and to me, that that to me sums up saying, here, this is what a test match animal looks like. This is what the game looks like when you've got people under pressure making the decision that's going to make the difference. And, and yes, they could do it. They weren't into the team specifically to do that. But when it mattered, they got the right decision right because they knew it would make the difference. And it won as a test match. And you had to create this culture and this environment, Ian, in a really short space of time. How differently did you work with the Lions compared to the clubs that you coached at where you might have pre season and then you can over time create a culture that might take two or three years to come to fruition. You had a matter of weeks and not only that, you had a matter of weeks with the best players who are usually at international level taught to hate each other. And a few weeks earlier were knocking each other's heads off. 
So what's the trick to creating that culture, but really quickly? And for a lot of the business people listening to this or the teachers that love to listen to this or the other professional sports people that download this podcast, I think there's a lot of learning for them in this space. Well, I think the big plus the Lions have is the badge. I think the respect that players have for the badge, it's got the four countries on it. Uh, I think it's still, even in this professional era, the biggest badge they can put on their jersey. So that means a lot because it then means that they have to look after it. They have to make it better. Uh, And what they put in, they know they have a legacy that they're following. You know, and I've always said to players, you never own you never own the jersey. It's yours for a short amount of time. But what you do with it makes all the difference in the world. Uh, and, well, and, and I think the great thing in 97, you know, you go back to that and it's exploded since really, was people wanted to wear the jersey. 30,000 people went out to South Africa to watch a test series that nobody thought the Lions would win. And, you know, the jerseys were sold out. Adidas didn't make enough jerseys and they had to make some more. Uh, But from our perspective, what, you know, and I said to them, look, people want to wear the jersey because of what you're doing in it. They don't want to wear something that's second best or is irrelevant and that you don't think is important. They think it's important because you think it's important. And, And that impact of other people being drawn in. And that Lions environment for supporters now has just got stronger and stronger. You know, they look after each other. They talk to each other. When you're wearing a Lions shirt as a spectator or as a player, it doesn't matter where you come from, you know, you're a Lion. And and I think that approach, that sort of involvement um, and that legacy is something which is... I think really important to keep hold of in any in any group, any any team, any badge. Um, but with Alliance, I suppose it's shown more because of you know those the four countries that um, only come together every four years. But you're back to people being in an environment they want to be in, and then trying to change that environment or develop it for the better. And then it, you know the next group that come four years' time will want to pick that up, do the same, and then move it on again. So you could probably travel to the other side of the world on your own for a Lions tour. If you're wearing the jersey, you're part of a family. Yes, without a doubt. And, and um, interesting story in a way, I suppose. Um, after... Um, 2009 tour uh, we did a charity sort of evening just open at, at Wasps um, in London uh, just a, an evening and just talking about the, the the Lions tour and things and there was people from all different clubs uh, there for the evening at the end of it um, an elderly lady came up to me and just said I want to say thank you and I thought she meant for the evening um, uh, and I said, oh, I'm pleased you've enjoyed the evening. So she said, no, not for the evening, she said, um, for the Lions. And I, I, I was sort of looked quizzically at her. And she said, uh, my husband died in February and and we spent four years saving up to go. We always wanted as a pair to go on the line, on a Lions tour. Uh, unfortunately, he, he died. Uh, and the family persuaded me to still go because it's something they felt their father would still have wanted her to do. She said, I went to South Africa for three weeks. And she said, in that three weeks, I was never alone. She said, people from different countries, whatever. She said, I wore a Lions jersey. I was something I was looked after and I was part of something that I felt was really Um, supportive and really belong to and she said god willing if i'm still alive in 2013 i'll be in australia as well wow 
Did you feel that responsibility when you were coaching that team that that's what the jersey and that's what the badge stands for? Because I think <clears throat> it's important to put it into context for players that are in that rugby bubble, that this is more than just a game of rugby. No, I, I think the impact it had on, you know, you go back to being a player that I never anticipated being a Lion, to be honest. Um, and then when I did, it had an impact. Those were the times you're away for four months, you know, so... Um, I had all sorts of things. We had to put the mortgage on hold, um, you know, because we couldn't afford to pay the mortgage because I wasn't getting paid. Um, so I was actually losing losing money. Uh, my wife was working, but um, we had to um, try and make it make it work. And, you know, I'm lucky as well that I've got a wife that, that has been fantastic for me in, and you're back to the support that talk to my parents and you know I've got a fantastic wife as well who's just um, allowed me to do it and you know when it mattered being there to talk to and and I think that all that is um, key. So can I ask you about this, the role of support and people around you then Ian because you've been an assistant, but famously you've had some quite charismatic, powerful assistants, like Jim Telfer comes to mind as an obvious example of that. What do you look for in an assistant when you're um, when you're recruiting for that role? I think you're back to respecting the differences. <laughs> <laughs> you want something that adds to your thinking. And, um, and in rugby, it's quite easy sometimes because... Obviously, you've got forwards and backs and defence and kicking and so so it's uh, you know goes back to ninety seven. But we for the first time because um, it only ever used to be a manager and a couple of coaches. Uh, the game had gone professional, so I I'd, I'd learned a few the year before. I'd been allowed to go out to South Africa to watch um, the Test series. Um, they were playing against the All Blacks in 1996. And at that time, I, I spent a week with the All Blacks, just from their perspective, looking at all the things that were needed to tour South Africa and be successful in South Africa. Uh, and I'd, uh, we picked up a, a, lot of different, a lot of different things. Um, and I did, a, I did a report and we, we looked at what we needed. Uh, and one of the things they said was just um, looking after all your own, not just people, but equipment. So we were completely self-contained equipment wise. And actually we'd got extra so that we could train in one place and the other kit was all being moved on the road to the next place. So that everywhere we went, the right equipment, the right training field was always set up for the players so there was a familiarity and we weren't reliant on things that could go wrong um, in other areas and the same I think you know um, a very good friend of mine Dick Best who I coached with um, said oh look there's a good coach who's been in South Africa now coaching at Harlequins uh, have a word with him because I was looking for an analyst so we wanted to have an for the first time. Um, and Andy Keese, who, who then went, was brilliant. He was a coach, but he was an analyst. And he was fantastic with the analysis. So we could pull things apart in different ways. We'd got Dave Allred, who did the kicking, you know, specific kicking skills, because we knew the kicking in the game was going to be crucial to us winning a test match. Um, and... With things like like that uh, for um, physio come looking at the fitness and how we were doing it, uh, and as well as the support the support staff, you know, Frank Cotton was a fantastic manager, but he'd also played in South Africa, so you'd got somebody with um, that instinctive rugby brain that you could pick or would say the or just the odd thing that would just help you clarify something, whatever it was. So I think when you've got a group like that where the intent is the same from everybody, 
but the, there's differences in knowledge, there's differences in understanding and, and approach that you draw out so much more. You're back to collective intelligence, I suppose. But it's the differences, I think, and it's respecting the differences. Brilliant. I think it's so interesting. So do you like to be challenged by your coaches around you? Is that important for you? Yeah, and the players. Um, you know, when I coached Scotland, John Rutherford coming through, we'd always got different ideas. He'd always come up with a, a new idea or something to try, which we'd then try and put in. Now, sometimes we try and change something and it would take us three games before we got it right. So we wouldn't introduce it until we were happy in training that we'd actually got it right. And then we'd put it in the game. But we'd had three weeks of knowing there was something down the line that we were going to introduce. And so, and I'd come up with something. And then what it did was it encouraged. So different players would come up with different thoughts or little moves or little tactic, whatever. Now, some you wouldn't use, but others. So all the time with this ongoing development, tactically, of things that challenged us to try and make something work, but make it make it different. I think it's I think it's really fascinating for people listening to this. And I know it's a, it's a rugby conversation, but there are so many takeaways for people in every walk of life. I, I'm, I'd like to share something that we haven't actually done on the podcast before. But I was talking to one of your former players ahead of this interview, Ian, and I didn't ask them anything specific other than, "Hey, I'm I'm interviewing Sir Ian McGeehan today for the High Performance Podcast," and they left me this voice note. Um, totally out of the blue, um, which I would love to share with you and share with the people listening to the podcast because I think it really takes us inside a lion's dressing room and not only does it take us inside the dressing room in terms of how brutal it is to be on a lion's tour, but I think how important emotion was for the team that you put together and how you drove the emotional side of your players to perform. So um, have a listen to this. I'd love to get your reaction. This is huh. Ugo Monia. <laughs> Voice message, but in 2009, after we lost the second test, which meant we lost the series, it, I mean, it's probably gone down in history as the most physical, one of the greatest games of rugby ever played. But our injury toll was massive. We had Jamie Roberts dislocated his wrist, his tour was over. Brian O'Driscoll knocked himself unconscious, his tour was over. Um, Adam Jones, our tight head prop, dislocated his shoulder, his tour was over. Gethin Jones, I think, fractured his cheekbone, his tour was over. Bruno Gara got a massive concussion, his tour was over. Simon Shaw, who'd been on two previous tours, um, that was also his first um, test match for the British Irish Lions, and he was man of the match, and he did the post-match interviews, cried. I didn't play in that test match, but I walked into the changing room, and... I've never, ever been in a more depressing change room in all my life. Um, you're not part of the team. You didn't play that day. You walk in, what can you say? I walked in, Adam Jones, they're trying to relocate his shoulder back into his socket. He's screaming. Brian O'Driscoll's walking around. Like, mate, don't know what day of the week it is. Jamie Roberts is there having his uh, shoulder treated. Gethin Jones is saying, Bruno Garo, you know, I guess he probably had one of the moments of that game. Um, he sat in the corner with his eye socket. I mean, his oh, eyes so swollen, sat there with an ice pack on his face. Um, you know, what do you say? How do you console these guys? How do you find the words? And Simon so Shaw just walks in and, and he's crying. And then I remember just Keach. He, 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 mate. He, he's always got the right words, but even he struggled that day. He was just crying. And then we had a big night out that night just to get out of our system. And then the next day, we all met together in the morning after breakfast. And he just woke up proud he was of the team. And then he started crying. And it was just like, like I said in my previous text, he's like everyone's granddad on tour. He's old, he knows what it is to be a lion, he was a lion himself, um, been involved in the game for a long time, won lots of medals, and yeah, I always think about the composition of the coaching staff, we had Sean Edwards, like this mad, this mad man, and all about passion and energy, we had Warren Gatlin, enthusiastic, and 
Geach um, was almost like he was the tonic to those two because um, they're he's got such a great history with the Lions and a great emotional connection with us. You know, he's he's certain McGeekin. Um, so he's respectful of all of us and when you're well, it's gonna be great to see any man cry, but when they're a bit older than you and you're looking at them and thinking that could be that's that could be my dad's like that's my dad stood in front of me crying in May cut you. So so yeah, he's an emotional guy. Leave them on your, along with his 11 month, 11 month old daughter trying to get in on the act as well. He describes you as that's my dad. Well, he describes you as his granddad, which I think you have to take as a, <laughs> as a compliment. Yeah. But my, when he says at the end, that's my dad. That's my dad stood in front of me, and you were in tears, and the players were in tears, and it's clearly, clearly still resonating with Ugo all these years later. How do you reflect when you hear when you hear that? <laughs> Um, well, I hope, um, you know, I hope, I hope it was, it, well, I think it's something significant for Hugo that, you know, I mean, he, he got the Lions understood and, um, you know, that, that night, I think in the dressing room, all I said was, we have to leave this tour on a winning note. We have to leave a winning Lions jersey for the next group who are going to put it on. Uh, and I, I said we're not training for the next four days. Um, uh, they went on safari or went with their families. I said, I don't want to see you. I said, all I want to see is you come back on Wednesday morning, and we're preparing to win a Lions Test match. And they went away. Didn't see any of them. Um, I went back to Joe Berg with my wife, and we just had a quiet two or three days. And when they turned up on Wednesday morning ready to try, we had to make nine changes to the team because of injuries and other things. But they all understood. They'd all been part of the process of the way we wanted to play. Um, and somebody who'd come flown over one of the Lions committee uh, board had come and watched the session on the Wednesday and said, uh, I can't believe that this team hasn't won a test match says so they just don't look like it. And it was one of the best sessions that I was ever involved with with them. And um, with all the changes and everything else, of course, they then went out on the Saturday and equaled the record score against South Africa in the third in the third test. Hugo scored his brilliant try from R twenty two with the intercept. Um, uh, and and Simon Shaw had become a giant. I mean, he was fantastic. Uh, and I think it's just, it's nice just to, you know, hear somebody like Hugo, he just just that importance to him. Uh, but but that feeling of the environment, which I hope was, was positive. And yeah, you do wear your heart on your sleeve a little I bit. Well, if you'll permit me, and I think having listened to Ugo's comments there, I think it's a great illustration of that famous quote that people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And that's the way he describes you is that he's not talking about your expertise as a rugby coach. He's talking about you as a person and your humanity and your decency and, and your ability to demonstrate emotional intelligence. If you were to apportion your success down to how much of it was down to technical expertise and how much was down to just your very essence of being a good person. What would you attribute <laughs> that uh, that proportion as? No, I think you need good people. I'm biased. I think rugby produces good people because you're in such a physical, demanding, dangerous environment in some respects that you get a response that you need that support. It is the ultimate support when you've got a, a good rugby team, a good group of people together. It's the ultimate support. And I think it, it does bring out the best. And I, and I think if you have good people um, collectively, you know, a support staff and, and as players, then I think good people make great things happen. 
Brilliant. Oh, it's been so good to sit and have this conversation. And one of my favourite moments from watching you talk to the players over the years is when you say to them, one day you'll see each other in the street. You won't say a word. You'll just exchange a look and you will know what you went through. And I think when we hear Hugo talking about his experience with you there, I think um, that's exactly what will happen when you bump into him in the street, isn't it? It is. I mean, every time we do. But I mean, you think it builds a relationship that doesn't go away. Uh, and and I, as I said, I feel very privileged to be able to be part of that. So, Ian, look, we're going to finish, as we always do now, with our quickfire questions. First of all, the one absolute unacceptable that you will not tolerate in and around your environment, be it work or home? Dishonesty. Good. What are your three non-negotiable behaviours that you and the people around you must buy into, Ian? Um, have the right attitude. Um, well, I would have said care care for what for what you can do f- for others to get the best out of them uh, and they remember that that the collective is far bigger and more important than the individual what advice would you give to a teenage ian just starting out in life apart from spending the five pounds <laughs> well from your dad? yeah um yeah stick with stick with your sport stick with sport um, it'll challenge you, but uh, you get a hell of a lot from it. How did you react to your greatest failure? I rang my wife. What did she and say? We, talk, we talked through it. And uh, she, we, she said, just what do you want to do? How do you want to do it? And I had a conversation where um, we worked out uh, and I had it clear, and she said, "You know, never uh, question what you want to do. Just um, understand what makes the difference." She sounds very wise. Yeah, she is. She's a good lady. <laughs> and what was that after? What was the failure? When we lost the first test in um, Australia in 1989, my my first test match as a coach. Did you win the series? Yes. Thank you, Mrs. McGeehan. <laughs> <laughs> um, are you happy? Yes. How important is legacy to you? Very. I think if you do things worthwhile, then you're passing on things which allow others to be better. And uh, the final question, your one golden rule for people listening to this podcast to live a high-performance life? Um, Appreciate the people and the environment that you have and can create. You You are a man who's built his reputation... In a, in a brutal sport but actually I think the reason for your success in such a brutal sport is your ability to understand the heart of the people that are in and around you so we can't thank you enough for coming on the podcast for the last hour or so and you know you've been generous enough to share 50 60 years worth of learning about life um, that the people listening to this podcast can now learn from themselves and we are so appreciative of that Now my pleasure Jake, Damien I've uh, really enjoyed it I can bore anybody about rugby, you know that. Oh, you haven't done it. It's been incredible. <laughs> Thanks, Ian. Uh, pleasure. Please hit subscribe, hit the notification bell, give us a thumbs up, leave a review, but somehow get involved with the High Performance Podcast and become part of our growing community. Thanks for being part of the adventure.